and I wish you a really, really glorious holiday, and we've had a good time this semester. We've had some great speakers, right? Okay, now Miss Dana Buckman. Who is Dana Buckman? A real woman, I would say, who is creative, modern, responsive, responsible, professional, a mother of two, a woman with a, a vision, and that is to make it easy to look cool and sophisticated at work. And vision, and that is to make it e easy, yes, I read that line, um, or at home, in timeless uh, designs, wearable classics that become part of a woman's personal style. Uh, born in Memphis, Tennessee, a graduate of Brown University, Dana attended the Rhode Island School of Design as a uh, president's uh, fellow. She earned an advanced degree in fashion from St. Martin's School of Art in London. To help encourage the next generation, she participated in the 1991 Claro Mentor Program she is an active member of Fashion Group and CFDA, which is an honorary group, as we know. Her unique approach to fashion has been rewarded by a loyal following from around the country. Known for her sporty silhouettes, supple fabrics, and beautiful prints, innovative textures with exquisite detailing, Dana has quickly established herself as one of America's top designers. Uh, and as you know, uh, I will go no further because you will hear from Dana her philosophy about uh, helping this woman who doesn't have time to spend dressing and worrying about what to wear. And you know, her, her uh, collection is the bridge level next to the high fashion level pricing. Uh, this collection uh, of bridge apparel gives the wearer good value. And now let me introduce Miss Dana Buckman. I hope I didn't mess that up. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Now, hi, y'all. I understand um, there's a mixture of designers and merchandisers. Could the designers raise your hand? I want to get a sense. Oh, boy, come on down. And merchandisers, marketers. And I know it can also change, and probably all of you will get a mush of a little bit of all of that before your careers are done. It's a pleasure to be here. I remember when I was y'all's age, which I'm not going to tell you how. Well, you can figure it out. I'm 54, so what was it, 35 years? Whatever. Um, you're on the edge of a big fabulous career. The fashion business is an unbelievable way to make a living. I came to New York in 1976, the year of the big ships after the education at Brown studying English, RISD studying fashion, St. Martin studying fashion, but it really started happening once I started to work. And back then it was all in New York. Now you're going to have a lot more. Am I, can you hear me? Can everybody hear? Okay. Thank you, RG. All righty. Um, and I've been excited about my career ever since. So congratulations on your choice of activity with your life. What I thought I'd do today is just tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about my company. I brought an eight-minute video, so when, when we get to that, you can just relax and watch. I wanted to give you a flavor of what my life, my career, my company's like. And I know you've been getting that from other people in the industry, just so you can put it in your memory bank and your thought bank when you go out and forge your own career. Every company out there is completely different. The cultures are different. The challenges, the needs are different. And you'll find as you get out there that you'll have to tailor everything you learned in school. You'll have it with you, but you'll really be thinking on, on your feet and as you enter your own particular course in fashion. So as Alice said, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee in the South. It served me all my life because as a designer who has a national brand, I know in my very body what it's like when Christmas is hot. 
that um, the climate is different all over the country, that the cultures are different, that down south when I grew up, everybody was really feminine and wore a lot of color. And so having that in my mind has really helped me as I've designed clothes. I started sewing at age 11. Does anybody in here like to sew? Are y'all still making things? Because it's a nice way to begin fashion. That appreciation of the fabric and the color and making things is something that's you know, also a great satisfaction. Um, when I came to New York, I got an, after all this education, ready to go, I was a designer, I had a vision, and I got a job picking up pens. Your first job does not have to be your best. I just recommend that you um, go to a company where you like the people or you like the product, or that it has something that will help you in your career. You might be paying your dues for a minute, and that's just the way it is. But What's good is you will be earning a little something and it'll be continuing your education. What you've had at FIT, I'm sure, has been a great preparation, but it's nothing like, I mean, it's not a replacement for what you'll learn out there on the job. So my first job was at Ellen Tracy. I was what was called an assistant designer, which back then meant I had to make patterns and I make the patterns for um, the head designer and actually cut out the garments. Most companies that don't do that anymore, I think you'll find most companies do a lot of their pattern work. Can y'all who are talking kind of keep it down a little or go outside? Um, most companies do it offshore, so there's not quite as much hands-on if you go the company route. Some of you, I imagine, will be going into starting your own companies, like the Nolita designers or the really grassroots, which is another way to go. I personally never had the guts to do that. I always wanted to work in a company where someone else was paying for it. I think uh, the other is maybe more courageous because you're using your own money. But either way, you'll, you'll find that what's great about fashion, it's, it's such a complex business, and so much goes into every garment. It's not just picking the color, but the quality of the velvet, for instance, in this. Finding the mill who can deliver it, who can deliver it at a price, making the sketch, how big is the lapel, how short do you make it so it fits the biggest number of people but still looks cool, how do you sell the garment, what blouse do you, you know, they're just endless complexity to fashion. I think that's, for me, been the source of why it's been so much fun for all these many years. Um, so my, I got my, I jumped around from these entry-level horrible jobs. I remember my father coming up to visit me. Are you, do you, any of y'all have parents watching your career beginning, that sort of voice on the shoulder? He came up and saw what I was doing. It was like, you know, I'm proud of you for working here, but oh my God, is this where it starts? And yes, it is. It starts often for a lot of you, right? way down at entry level, and that's just how it is. I think I spent about seven or eight years at entry level. Finally went to work for Liz Claiborne, who became a mentor and good friend. She had just founded her company, I think in 19, um, something like 76, was it, 79? And I went there in 81, and she and I just clicked it off. So that's another recommendation. If y'all can find mentors along your way, it's just, it's unbelievably rich experience and it can really help you, someone who you really speak with. Um, what we had in common is we both liked the women we designed for. I've never, personally, I don't want to design theater runway clothes. Some of you all might like that. It's a beautiful entertainment. I came at it more from a feminist um, 70s side. I wanted to dress real women who were going to break the glass ceiling and finally proved that men and women were just alike and that there was no difference to them. Can you believe I thought that in 1974? I remember going home and telling my parents all about my new understanding that men and women were alike. I've learned a little since then, but it's helped me in my clothes. Um, I have always designed for the real women who are actually running charities, running companies, journalists, realtors, moms, whatever the career is. To me, that's, they have been my muse and have been sort of the driving inspiration behind my company from the beginning. I worked for Liz doing this kind of clothing. She really pioneered it when she opened her company. And about um, five or six years into my career, she decided, she and her husband decided they wanted to open a more expensive line. So my break, and this, you know, you'll keep out as your stories unfold, keep attentive to this, was just sort of being in the right place at the right time, to have my own brand. She asked if I would, wanted to name it after me, and you know, how long do you think it took me to decide that answer? Um, it was just being in the right place at the right time. It was fabulous because they um, supported me the first two years. We lost buckets of money, buckets, but then the next 18 years, we've sort of paid it back to the corporation, so it kind of worked out both ways. Um, 
And what was great is she sort of gave me the keys to the kingdom. She was a friend. She was sort of like my mother a little bit. Um, Here, Dana, you do this. And then she would come to the shows. It wasn't, uh, wasn't like witchy mother looking over the shoulder saying, oh, why didn't you do it that way? It was just really do your vision. And it's been a, just a wonderful, wonderful life. I like the people I work with. I like the women I dress. I love making things. I love playing with color and fabric. And I would imagine that all of you have some bit of that passion in you, um, or you wouldn't be here. You will need it in fashion. It's a very difficult business, and it's gotten more difficult. Is the, um, there are fewer companies now, fewer companies, bigger companies. There's all this global thing going on. I imagine there'll be a little reaction to that. I know a lot of the women I meet don't want to see themselves coming and going everywhere. So there is room for you designers who want to start your own little tiny brand and sort of service a special crowd. There's so many um, aspects to it. So I think as you find your niche, you'll be aware of what's making you happy. And as you go begin your career, you might find yourself in a job for a little bit that isn't so happy. But just stay aware and see what it's doing for you, if, it, if you're learning anything, if you're meeting people, and keep your eyes open. Make sure you meet everyone you can. If you work in a big company, try to find out who else works there, what jobs they do. Would you rather have any of their jobs than your own? If so, go after them. What I liked about fashion was that um, no one really ever asked me where I went to school. It doesn't matter your credentials. It's really what you can offer at that one moment. And I found that very freeing. So you can kind of recreate yourself all the time. If you're designers, design all the time. And I imagine if you're passionate, you do. Be aware all the time. I remember my husband, who's a lawyer and now he's a judge, would just cringe when I'd go into restaurants and sort of want to reach out and touch the woman's clothes. Because I was always looking at clothes, always thinking about it. Oh, look. Oh, look. And what's great about clothes is it's all around you. I mean, he's got the perfect job because he'll never be without a business. They're always criminals. But in fashion, too, women will always have to buy, men and women will always buy clothes in some form or another. So you'll always have some kind of um, opportunity. Right now, my company's around, I'm not supposed to tell the volume, somewhere in the range of 150 million wholesale. If I add up over the 18 years how many garments we've shipped, it's sort of like, oh my gosh. Um, we sell nationwide. Our biggest accounts are Neiman's and Saks, Bloomingdale's, um, all across the country. Um, there are about 100 of us that work at Dana Buckman. It's like a tight-knit little team. Everybody's very devoted. We get totally into it. We're trying on clothes all the time and comparing notes on what sell. The other thing, what didn't, the other thing about fashion is you always know how well you did. Just like in college, you get a report card in fashion you know, by the next season, how you did. And if, I always thought if it didn't sell, I didn't do well, whether it was my fault or not. And what you'll notice, there are a lot of variables now. The state of the department stores is just terrible. It's very expensive to run your own boutique, blah, blah, blah. There's all these other factors that aren't under your control. But as a person in the business, you have to be aware of it and stay attuned of it because it does affect how the clothes do. So it does really affect you. When we started um, in 1980, what was it, 1988, my, uh, right now I have two daughters, 17 and 19. That's how I can remember how old the company is. I had just um, opened right after my older daughter was born. Back then, when women had, were sort of finding, had found their, their place in the workplace, but everything was very coordinated. Y'all were probably in kindergarten then. I can't do the math this quick, but it was the days of big shoulders. The shape was sort of triangle. Fabulous. Business was fabulous. There was lots of money flowing. Women wouldn't just go in and buy one piece to wear over their jeans. They would buy a turquoise suit with a turquoise skirt and a turquoise pant and a print to go. They'd buy multiple sales every time. It was fabulous. Very easy. And the other thing is because the shape was like this, the same garment looked fabulous on a woman who was full and on a woman who was skinny, whether you were short or tall. This shape was magic. Business was phenomenal. I hope we go back to that within a decade or so. Or so. What has happened over the years is there have been a lot of factors that have changed the way my woman dresses. So I haven't changed the target consumer. She's always been, I would say, late 20s to the end. Um, uh, about half career women, half women who uh, work in charities or who are moms or whatever. They have to have a certain income because my clothes are bridge pipe price point. So the jackets are sort of five to eight hundred dollars. So an outfit sort of 
seven to a thousand, seven hundred to a thousand dollars. So it's sort of well-to-do women, but she's changed over the years. And as a designer and as a merchant, y'all will find your job is to notice these changes. It's also part of the fun. Things have gotten more casual. Workplaces are more casual. With the shapes now being much slimmer than they were, it's much harder for one one style to fit the wildly different body shapes that exist out there. It's just much more tricky, much more complex. I'm getting competition from the cheap stores, like Target has become a chic to buy things at Target, Target and J. Crew, and the catalogs are looking good. So the business has changed. The other thing that happened, and this probably doesn't matter to you all at all because of your age, but for me it mattered a lot, is my Target age group, the boomers, went through this revolution and decided they wanted to look younger all of a sudden. Not ridiculously young, but I think just being influenced by y'all's age group and my teenager's group, we decided it was too early to get old. And as, as fashion got slimmer and hotter and more itemy and more casually and all the denim, we wanted it too. So as a designer, I've had to be attuned to that. I couldn't keep dressing even my career women as I did at the beginning or I'd go out of business. So we did a revamping of the company, not only because in 20 years some of my women have aged out and aren't shopping as much and I need to get the younger ones who didn't grow up with me, but also my target woman got younger in her mind. So we spent a lot of time at my company and we'd been, this started I guess three years ago, we'd been tremendously successful for like 15 years doing what we were doing. So coming up with this change, and I'm telling you this story so you'll remember it when that happens in your careers. So it's keeping the same mission, but coming at it a different way, which is really sort of what design is about, designing something beautiful, something that's right for your target. So we went through a lot of thinking and um, came out with this new look. And I don't know if any of you have followed my collection. It's been very successful, but we've kind of come out with it young, a younger in spirit feeling. So what I brought now is a little video, it's eight minutes, so just put your feet up, there won't be a test on it, to give you a flavor of my company, how closely we work together, how collaborative a really healthy garment company can be, and to show you a little bit of the philosophy that went into our change. So could the um, media people play the video? When you put a collection together, you never really see it till the day of the show. You see pieces and snatches. So today is the first time I see it together. Come at the end, do your little wave or a little bow, whatever, because you have your cute little skirt. Uh -huh. Dana has always been such a classic. I think she pretty much speaks to everyone. Dana Buckman, to me, really exemplifies the American woman. Okay, here we go. Changing. She's evolving. What's changed is my customer, and I've changed with her. She's becoming I mean, clearly much more modern, more urban. It's all about the mix. Clothes that are a little more form fitting. I want pieces to do a million different things. A little more, when I say ease, I don't mean in the fit of the clothes, but in the attitude of the clothes. You can be as young, as sophisticated, as sexy as you want to make it. It's all here for you to use. Uh, Dana is the designer for a lot of our customers. She's very important for us. After the show, it's not over. You think, ah, oh, it's done, but that's really when it starts. Hi, y'all. Hello. Good afternoon. The next step is selling it, getting into the stores. It's going to be the braided leather and the orange zest. Red or green. We're here to buy a new collection, and I'm very impressed with what I'm seeing. The embellished tunics. I think it's a truly big step for the company. I mean, this is really exquisite. I think it was about a year ago when we came out with our fall collection, and people said there's something different going on at Dana Buckman. Space dyes are my middle name. There's like 92 different colors in here. Oh, wow. As a market editor at Vogue, it's my role to go out and pound the pavement. I love the bullion. It's not always the case that you get walked through the collection by the designer, which is a great treat. You know, you really need every piece in here. That's what I keep telling the retailers. <laughs> the collection has changed and it's livened up. The silhouettes are sexier. These are actually beaded gores, so it's got that movement. And then here's my denim shrine. 
I think it attracts a younger audience now. The skirts here are cotton boil. Dana Buckman is like a Ralph Lauren, a Donna Karen, you know, major player in the fashion industry. They're an important person to see because they're very directional. And what Dana is doing with her collection and with her customers is moving them forward and taking them up a notch. As a designer, I love to take risks if I believe in where they're going. I have never changed my mission. My mission is to dress real women who run America. That hadn't changed. What's changed is those women. Women today want clothes that are faster. They want clothes that mix. It's no longer about coordinates. It's about pieces that do a lot of different things. Is this for the long skirt? Yeah. I, a few years ago, was a little more classic, a little more timeless. And now I feel like I've gotten younger in the last years, me personally. Isn't this cute? And I've made my collection look younger. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, I just love my new skirt. I feel very summery now. You know, I don't think a 50-year-old has to look like an 18-year-old. But feeling young, now that's fabulous. This has to go out today? Oh, yeah. This business is such high pressure, I can't tell you. Can we bring it in a little more? Yeah, yeah. We finish one season, and then we have to sit down while it's still going into the showroom and start the next season. What's next? The strap's too short. Yeah. Well, I don't like, these buttons are just placeholders, right? right. We're not really doing that. This is all size A. We have to get all of this out today? Yes, it's a lot. I always start the season with the designers, just take a minute. Tell me some more about embellishment. It's out there, people are loving it. And talk about what do you wish you had? How are we going to evolve it down into these later months? What's next? And visualize that fabric all in white, but different shades of white thread. So it's a jack card. But it now look it's going to look like the jack card, but it's all embellished. It's all Dana's really great about having a very open, warm forum so that nobody feels intimidated about bringing their ideas to the table, and all ideas are welcome. Encrusted or just scattered? No, encrusted. Okay. And sometimes she gets very quiet, and then I know she's sort of thinking about it, and if she's thinking about it, then that's a good thing. I'm having a hard time with the Lorex. It's awfully shiny. I think it's so fabulous. What are you seeing? I can see a skirt in that. Or a little sexy skirt. Yeah. Oh. oh, look at the, the pointel, yeah. My day isn't only about designing. Oh, good, the orange quilted came on. I'm also talking to the account people who hear what's selling on the floor. How about this? This is great. great. Yeah, and, and just mixing and matching has been going over very well. Is there any more brownies? Yes, I think it's too premature to ship cashmere now. Oh, that'd be crazy. Right. I hear updates on shipping, things that didn't leave the factory in time. So have we received them yet? I was wondering if any of these prints are here yet. There's so many components. I feel like an orchestra conductor sometimes, trying to bring them on home. The Dana Buckman collection is different today because I feel different. The young associates here think I'm this mellow woman. <laughs> it wasn't always true. Oh, you mean the, the notes at 5 a.m. in the morning that are on your desk? Yeah, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, that's good. The whole beginning of my career, I thought that throwing myself into the job with everything I had would make me successful. Well, we want to uh, say hello to Dana Buckman and welcome. Welcome. Thank you. And I was on an adrenaline high from like 5 in the morning till 11 at night, every night, every night, every night, seven days a week. It's something you have to watch out for. It's addictive and it's heady and it's exciting and it can take you away from this. <laughs> We'd do paper dolls with her and that's like Sunday night thing. And she'd be working on her next fashion show. Yeah, she would draw like little like <laughs> outfits for us and we could like play with them and everything. Annie, you gotta go for the bus. Bye. But yeah, she would get up in like the wee hours of the morning and work all the time. Hello, doll. Uh, can you wait? Uh, Balancing career and family is something that's very hard. I'd come home with that sort of fire-eating self, and the girls would look at me like, who's that? They're actually the ones who taught me I needed balance. Sweet simmered pork chops. That sounds good. When I go home, there's a different time frame. Did you do the honey? Yeah, I put honey. I can't be rushed. I can't make lists. Nobody does what I tell them to. She's much calmer than she was when we were younger. Very bad oh, posture. there's Lewis arriving. I love that. They talk to me. We talk about everything. Everything. Oh, whoa. Let's see the back. Sometimes Tom has to leave. <laughs>
Tom and I have been married 20 years. We met at a party. I saw him leaning up against the wall. I I said, mm-hmm. When I met Dana, she was a junior designer for Liz Claiborne. She was uh, very unassuming and down to earth. I knew right away. I think I proposed within a week. She's just, she's really just terrific. <gasps> the motorcycle. I don't know what came into the guy. <laughs> He's a mild-mannered, kind of serious person. I'm a, a criminal court judge sitting as an acting Supreme Court judge. I try major felonies, murder, robbery, assault. And then he's got this wild side that just came out at 50. They're known as the hippest parents in my school, like my throughout dude. my entire grade. They came to my lacrosse game the other day, and they were like, those people are so cool. Whose parents are those? And I was like, mine. <laughs> Yeah. Knowing that they're there, they're steady, they support me, is really a great feeling. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. My parents were very supportive when I was growing up. I think about that a lot as I'm raising my girls. I've loved clothes from when I could walk. I've always been trying things on, piecing things together. I got a sewing machine when I was 11. It was only after I finished college and I couldn't go any further with English literature. I thought, maybe fashion. What I like best about fashion is there's two sides. There's a the whole artistic, the color, the fabric, I'm feeling side. The shell pants. And then there's the career woman in Chicago who needs to go to work looking cool. What's she going to wear? So what I'd love to do is to be able to stand here and see denim, denim, denim mixed in. I have a lot more leather coming for fall. <gasps> I love my customer. Here we Jess, go. you are so fabulous. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Great on you. You can stand next to me anytime. Well, it was pretty crazy because I came here just to shop and then Dana's here. How about this Fabulous jacket. Ooh, I'm loving this already. My mother has been a Dana Buckman fan forever. And then, uh, just recently, I started uh, shopping here as well. <laughs> here I am. Oh, that's it gorgeous. Up. All of a sudden, I'm getting kind of a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Oh, beautiful. Fabulous. Which was like a dream come true. What do you think? I love it. And the sales for Dana Buckman in the last two years have really been fantastic. Dana has really hit her stride. I feel like women in America are in a good place now. These days, women who are powerful, who are involved, who are engaged, they're much more eclectic in the way they dress. There's a celebration of individuality, and I really feel at home with it. I'm going to be 54. Best years of my life. <laughs> and I feel like I've been going through this growth part of my journey, and what's so fabulous is I get to bring my company with me. Can I see how it goes over the hip? So the clothes are changing, my relationships at work are changing, and that's what I'm reflecting in my collection. I guess that's always true of fashion. I like today much better than any of the other seasons. I'm sorry about the color in that. It looks like all I make is raspberry color clothes, but I don't know, it's in the equipment or whatever. Um, so that's sort of it for my presentation. What I'm going to do now is just put some shots of my spring collection, and I don't know how technically they're going to work, so we can talk if y'all have questions, and you can just look up on the screen. I just pulled a few looks from spring, which I showed when was that in September, and it'll start shipping in March. Anybody have any thoughts? Are you ready to go out there? We need you, need you uptown on the Garment Center. Quick study. All right. I know that was more information than you needed on me personally, but it sort of comes with the whole DVD. Is everybody cool? Whoa. OK, I have some technical problems here. One of the things, I didn't mention this, now that um, as we've gotten bigger and the company's matured, I have five designers who actually do the designing. And I'm involved in supervising it and blessing everything. And I spend my time out on the road meeting the consumer, um, meeting, having lunch with editors. Yes, that's one of the parts of my job. It's so tough. I go in and get my hair and makeup done and go out to lunch. And I go home and tell my husband what I did all day. And he said, you did that? I mean, I was out there in the Bronx dealing with the Herps and the Vicks and anyway, but that's one of the lucky thing, fun things that has happened. We have six stores all over the different parts of the country. Our latest two are we just opened in Las Vegas and Boca. Oh, this is just a loop from the show, right? 
Um, we have the shows in our showroom. We're at 41st and 7th. It used to be Chase Bank, and it's this gorgeous showroom with tall ceilings that used to have a vault and all the tellers and the terrazzo floors. And so we're lucky enough to produce our own show shows there. And I've always had mixed feelings about a show because a show, it's very expensive, and you sometimes, I mean, I, I'm such a literalist. I usually show only what I'm going to make. Sometimes I'll make a couple of things. But it's really for the editors and the buyers to get excited about the collection. Really what we sell across America is, you know, there's much more behind this. These are just sort of the fun things that show up on the runway. And for you all, as you go in your career, you'll notice the dichotomy, this strange ritual we have in fashion of the runway show and how it is related to the real clothes that Americans buy and that, which will keep you in business, pay your salary so you can put on the next show, and how those are related is one of the, sort of an interesting thing you have to deal with in your business. Also getting the press for your company, which again, at the beginning in the 80s, I didn't care about press, build the great product and they will come. It's a philosophy I had learned from Liz Claiborne, who at that time did no advertising whatsoever. And, built itself into sort of a $4 billion company. These days, you really do have to engage in marketing. I mean, I know you all probably are not as shocked by it as I was, but it's just a part of American life, and you have to do it. So having um, a runway show is a bit of marketing, as well as getting out there talking about how great the clothes are, how beautifully they fit, and I don't know. I do a lot of traveling across the country and actually meet the women, and it's very helpful. I was just in Chicago and Houston, and. California to see how women live, to see what they see. I go in the dressing room and what is it they see when they put something on? There's a whole psychology element, sociology. How are, how are the young socialite women in Dallas dressing these days? Well, it's much different than it was 10 years ago. Much more casual, a lot of emphasis on shoes and bags. And how does that affect the clothing? And it does, of course. I sell a lot of soft dressing. My angle, my particular angle is tailored clothes and soft clothes, very feminine. In the show, I'll put it on the runway with no lining. When I ship it, I'll make sure there's a little lining so that you know, our Puritan customers can understand it. Oh, the color on this is horrible. I don't know if I can bear to look at it. Oh my gosh. I hope you'll just have to have faith that it doesn't look like that. I probably should, oh man. The good thing about clothes is they're sort of fun. You know, it's sort of a joyful thing. And giving something, um, designing something for a woman who puts it on and feels, feels good about herself, feels ready to rule the world, feels confident, feels happy. I mean, it's a very satisfying feeling. And it's not brain surgery. And it, I remember when I went into the business, um, this, I made my decision in the 70s, it was a time of great social conscience, Vietnam, feminism, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, could I really go into something as frivolous as fashion? And I justified it to myself. Well, A, number one, I had nothing else to do in mind. And the art school was down the street from the college. And I had a boyfriend wanted to say, you know, all these extraneous circumstances. But number two is people do have to get dressed in the morning. And how you dress totally affects how you feel about yourself. I mean, especially when you're meeting people or you're needing to sell yourself or present yourself, having clothes that fit well, that are beautiful, that are balanced from the shoulder, all of that really affects how you do in your job. So I sort of made my justification and enjoyed it ever since. Yes. Yes. Hi. We do have plus sizes. They've been extremely successful. We've had um, petites probably for 12 or 14 years and plus sizes for at least 10. And it's quite a wonderful part of the business because a lot of women go to, uh, when we went into plus sizes, there weren't a lot of plus sizes around, which is funny because there's certainly a variety of sizes in America. But now what I'm noticing is there's a lot of interselling, and sometimes women aren't, you know, aren't any either plus size or missy size, and they can cross sell. So it's been a great thing. It's designed, it's part of the line, so you can intersell. Um, what you'll notice as you go into your fashion business is the way people are shaped is so different one from another. Like I'm, a, I'm slim for my height. You can be like a six foot tall or five foot tall and be a size zero, you know, and as a designer, your job is to, to figure out how you're going to address that, 
you know, whether you're going to try to, I try to dress a wide number of people, which is how I've gotten my company to be, be big, because I can dress a wide variety of shapes and sizes. You might decide to pick a body shape and go after it. Some of the Europeans, you know, their size, I have to wear their size 14 or something. They're designed for little teeny tiny people. You know, you'll pick, pick your niche, but it is something you have to pay attention to. Yes? I would say my age, really, realistically, I'd like to say it's 20s, but it probably starts in the 30s just because of the price, and then it goes up till the end. My mother-in-law is pushing 80 and still loves the clothes. As I get older, you know, the eight, these decades don't seem as old as they used to anymore. The real young kids, I don't, like y'all's age group, I don't dress not only price, but also just look. It's a little bit more formal, more dressed up. My daughters raid my closet selectively. Yes? How it works. Um, my main focus is what I actually ship to the stores. That pays the bill. And also that's who I want to dress. The runway stuff I've added reluctantly. And it's been good, but my main target is these women Hillary, newscasters, um, realtors, thinkers, what are the women I admire who run the country. Um, so I start thinking about them. We always start with color. The designers start with puffs of color. It's, it, a lot of this is really like playing, paper dolls. Remember when you were little sewing for your dolls? Cut puffs of color, all the fabric people come to us since I've been in business so long and I'm that kind of person. I believe in relationships. So a lot of it is, I know the suppliers and have known them for years. They bring me the stuff. We work together. It's all exclusive. And it's only after the color and the fabric do the shapes start coming in. And then as the shapes come and the fabrics come, you have to go back and alter it. So it's always a process in the way my company approaches it. It's not like I design something and that's it and it comes out like that. It kind of gets altered. When you feel how drapey the fabric is, then you decide really how big you want the lapel, that kind of thing. When we end up with the line we like, and it's always geared towards what will the woman who lives across the country really want to buy, then we go back and start putting together the fashion show. And I don't stray too far. I'm not, and I think I've been punished for this in the press by getting very little press. I don't, I'm not a publicity hound. I don't design fabulous things for the runway that never appear. I don't have the resources. I'd rather spend the resources on designing clothes that fit perfectly and make my women petite to plus size look fabulous. Um, it's just not me. It's not my personality. But in our runway, we do put together a little bit more edgier looks. We combine things that maybe I wouldn't have expected my customer to buy. So that's kind of how we get around it. The models, of course, are all like nine feet tall. And as a feminist, I often get challenged, why do you do that? And we did have some 15-year-old models. And it, the feminist side of me thinks, what's that saying? But the marketing side of me, that's, it's almost like it's this rarefied language, like of ancient Japan or something, when your kimono band, if it was this color, it signified that, and only these people. You know, it's, it's, some, it's a very formalized thing that you have to use these tall, willowy, very young models. So I do. But then, of course, I have to adjust them. Like for, to make sure that the decolletage is not too low or that they're not too nipped and not too short. So I do all those modifications. And if I do it well, then I get a little publicity and the women in the country are happy and I sell a lot of clothes, which is sort of the point to me. Other people, there are designers who really just want the publicity. They start with the show. Some of my friends start with the show. It all comes from that. And if they don't sell very many, that's fine. And that's another way to be. Yes? The question is, what do I look for when I hire designers? That's an excellent question. It's one of my favorite ones. I'm going to go really fast. The number one thing, the number one thing is to remember you have about seven seconds to make your impression. Any job, it's not just fashion. Seven section. I meet somebody, everybody, everybody. You meet someone and you kind of start forming your opinion. 
So you don't have to dress expensively, but be very careful with how you dress. Make sure you look exactly like you want to look. Don't leave anything to chance. Your bag, your shoes, your hair. Designers are visual people. We have images built up in our heads. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be you. It can be quirky. It can be whatever image you want it to be, but just it is part of your presentation, and it's part of that seven seconds. The next thing is your handshake. Everybody in the room, you have to practice it. Firm, rock-hard handshake, looking the person dead in the eye as if it's, been you, it's you who I've wanted to meet all my life. When I met Hillary before we went to her bedroom and tried on clothes after her first, um, Bill's first election, she had, you know, great politicians have this ability to make you think, oh, Dana, I've been, I wanted to meet you, this amazing charisma. And everybody in this room can have it. It's a firm handshake and the eye lock with sen true sincerity, I'm not saying this to be cynical, but your initial presentation is huge. This isn't really quite your question, I'm gonna to get to that. Do your research, know everything there is you can find out about the company. You don't have to prove that you know it, but just have it as if it's so natural, of course you know about them. Drop a couple of nice things. I, I really admire your company. I love what you've been doing, Dana, how you've gotten a slightly young, no, no, to make it clear to the person that you know all about them and that you think they're hot. Later on, you can decide if you want the job or not. But in the interview, you're selling yourself, and your job is to leave that interview with the job offer. So go into it with confidence and with a mission, because it's good practice, because you can use it the next time and the next. For, assistant, for designers who are applying to work, I want a great looking portfolio. You know what matters a lot, and sometimes I see it, is I don't want a sloppy portfolio. I don't want dog ear to edges. It's got to look really good. It's part of your presentation. This business, I mean, it is superficial and frivolous. It is fun. But that means everything matters. The presentation all matters. Your shoes shine, the portfolio edges, your resume. Don't ever misspell the person's name. If they put a K in my name instead of an H, I've never hired anyone who did that. Not because it matters that much, but that kind of attention to detail, I can't risk in a multi-million dollar business. It matters, and I want people who know it matters. In a portfolio, I want creativity, I want verve, I want fresh ideas. I don't want you to design the classic business suit. I kind of know how to do that. I know my portfolio was absurd. I can't believe I got a job. It was from St. Martin's, which is this very groovy, very haute fashion school. Um, but I think I was there on an off year because I didn't have a single seam in my portfolio. I had nothing that anyone anywhere would ever wear. And I got my job, I think, because I clicked with the designer. It was more, you know, they say that about jobs. A lot of it is your personality, what you exude. When I hire people, I want to make, I want to get the feeling that they want the job, that they're creative but not that they're so protective, like everything's so precious, like look at this that I designed. Because in fashion, I need to see a lot of designs, a lot of ideas. If I want to be able to hate 10 of them and have you come back and say, oh, that's okay, here, look, I've got 10 more. Let's. So you want to exude this at ease with yourself and with your designing. Like it's so easy for me, I could do this all day long and I can do it for you. I want to feel confidence, I could do it for you. Not uppity, not, uppity, not arrogance, not, Definitely not an attitude, because I don't. I got my own attitudes already working there. I would never hire someone where I get any hint of an attitude, because it, I, I know it's going to come out later anyway. But I want the portfolio to show who you are, show a lot of creativity, and don't put junk in there that's not good and timely. Don't show. Don't include freshman stuff. Don't include things with smudges. Don't include ragged edges on your swatches unless that's part of the look. Everything about your presentation matters. And the same with the merchandisers, even more so, because you'll all be dealing with numbers and quantities. Just run over everything in your bit, and even practice with your friends on what you're going to say. Because all of that helps sell you in those seven seconds for the first impression. And usually an interview, is a, the, it's decided within five minutes, really, whether there's a future here. It's my two cents. A handshake, you got to practice it. Practice it hard, harder than you believe. Look them in the eye. It really makes a huge difference. Y'all good? You ready to go into your career in fashion? We're ready to have you. Come on down. Good luck with everything.
useful, and that would also be a logo, right, development. The byline, which you, you see, uh, and, and I think it, it, actually I think this is so valuable. A, a byline to me is basically what business the brand is in. So Whirlpool is in the home appliance business. I, I just think that's so interesting. A lot of people just start, they think that um, everybody knows what, what uh, uh, <coughs> business the brand is in. And, uh, um, and they forget about the byline. A tagline is an advertising tagline. And in this case, it's a job well done. And on every, uh, um, Whirlpool, and this is a little bit of an anomaly because, you know, a brand promise, which we haven't really talked about today, we talk about developing, um, a, you know, a, a, a vision statement uh, or a brand promise and all that. But they put their brand promise on every product um, um, and er every piece of, uh, of advertising material because um, they believe in it. So they, because your life is getting busier and more complicated, Whirlpool brand appliances are easy to use, save time, help manage your home better. So everything that they do, or what they, the way this should work, is this is their value proposition. And everything that they, they make, new products, new things, they bump um, th what, what their new idea, their new concept or existing uh, products up against this. And if it doesn't meet this value proposition, then you shouldn't do it. I mean, that's basically how this all works. And it's hard to do, very hard to do, to be able to do this. This part of it, you know, is, you know, this is where the consultants come in and they basically help you do all this. But doing this every day and what we call living your brand promise every day is the hardest thing to do. But it's the things that the great brands do and do day in and day out and, uh, um, and succeed. I do, I do. Um, you know, when you when you you know when you hear um, uh, you know a founder like Phil Knight, you know, or you hear a founder like uh, Charles Schultz and people like that who understand and really um, you know believe that they have you know they they understand the brand in and out, and they and you can hear passion in the way they talk about their brand and enthusiasm and everything. Um, you know, that's those are the things that are um, um, that's where your brand equity just grows exponentially. Step four, create ambassadors. I'm gonna, that's a good lead into what I was going to say. Create ambassadors for your brand and, and all that. This is both internally and externally. You know, and I know I'm using Starbucks as, as an example a lot today, but I'll just give you, um, you know, uh, a story here. Uh, it's happened probably maybe about a year ago, and 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 I was uh, I was online at Starbucks, and a woman was in front of me, and I'm not quite sure what transpired, but the um, server basically said, "Did I get your order?" And she said, um, she goes, oh, she goes, I think, you know, I, 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 uh, I messed up and everything. So she said, I'll make, I'll make yours right now. And she uh, left the station and she said to the other people standing on, she goes, I'll just be a minute. She said to everybody else there, I'll just be a minute. And she left the station and she made her her drink right there. And, um, and she handed it to her and she said, um, that's on me. And she said, no, by the way, here's a certificate so the next time you're in, you can also have another free drink. Okay, so what do you think happened to everybody in that place at that moment? A wholesaler, if I ever heard of one. Um, um, but you know, but what happened? There's a, so so um, has the company empowered that associate? Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, to do something like that. Um, but what that does is that that you know. That builds these ambassadors for your your brand. So not only do you have people in the company who believe in the brand promise and believe in everything that that uh, they've been taught, but then you you develop this um, this whole ambassador, these apostles, if you will, of your brand. Um, and you don't think I you know I tell that story in a group like this, you know, and I'm sure there was other people in there who tell that story as well. And that I think that's those uh, those those moments of uh, of emotional connection with the brand. That are highly important, and those are the th those are the things um, that you know great brands do to be able to, in the service industry especially, uh, to be able to build great brand ambassadors. And by the way, I've, you know, <coughs> I mentioned you know, I worked at Neiman's for a while, and I worked with Bert Tansky, and Bert would call it the Yenta Express, right? <laughs> and he'd say, you know, he said, you know, at cocktail parties and all that stuff, you know, 
you know, people talk about, you know, the service and what they've, you know, the kind of service they received at Neiman Marcus. And if it's good service, you know, um, you know, the Express goes one way, but, you know, the Yent Express also goes the other way too, you know. Um, and it's, and that, that word of mouth, that power of, of, of brand ambassadors, you know, uh, is, is immeasurable when it, uh, when it serves you the right way. Celebrity endorsements, yeah. Well, you know, that's a whole, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other topic that we could talk about because it's, um, you know, celebrity endorsements and everything you know, is this two-edged sword. No, I know. Right, right. And that gets in. Yeah. Right. But there is a growing momentum of that because, you know, remember, and I think this is your point and everything, where people don't believe in advertising and, and marketers are trying to find, you know, other things, that, you know, whether they're product placement, that's why product placement is becoming so big on shows and TVs, and, um, uh, TV shows and movies and things like that. You know, um, the, you know the, we've all heard the demise of the 30 second spot and, you know, all those other things because of TiVo and, and all that. So there's other new gateways, pathways of how to get your product message across. Right, right. Enough, then, I mean, like, sure. Right. And sometimes, you know, in, in the early days it was done fairly innocently because it worked in the script and then people got pretty savvy to it, you know. Okay. Um, the living your brand promise every day. We've kind of talked about this. Um, uh, and But this whole thing about, as we use the Whirlpool example and all that, once this is all developed and you develop your brand promise and you develop um, the things that you want, those brand attributes of what you want your brand to be, you've just got to do it every day because um, customers will call you on it if you don't. Practice integrated marketing. We've touched on this before. I, I only find that this is just so important because I just know how many organizations are basically um, uh, fractured when it comes to this, that they've got different um, uh, groups working on at, at the end goal. And if, and if it's not all coordinated, um, specifically and totally integrated um, in terms of both in, in, in on the creative and the budget and all that, things fall apart. And this is one of the, the successes that we've had, um, getting back to you know, our private brand advertising, uh, where um, we've um, um, been, been consistent about integrated marketing. I just put this up at the end because I just wanted to recap as an example of one of the brands that you know, we, uh, we market at at uh, Federated in terms of, uh, which is, which is Inc. And our, our basically, you know, our mission statement for Inc. is that, you know, it's, it's modern and sophisticated with a youthful image. Uh, Inc. International Concepts captures cutting edge trends and interprets them to a busy woman's lifestyle. So that was our, everything that we do, we bump that up against it and say, does this make sense? Does this work? I have a question. Yeah. Is it Inc. or is it I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was there at the beginning of the Right, right, right. I was uh, thinking the same thing. <laughs> I, I thought we must have just evolved. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll tell you, you know, what we've, what we've done is that um, through, um, um, you know, the only, the only time we actually ever comes into play is in broadcast. Because that's the only time you ever have to, have to, you, have to, you, have to you know, verbalize the brand and, and all that. And we do just for, just for broadcast because it's a lot easier. We, we say ink and broadcast, you know, rather than I and say. Well, is it Target or Target? Yeah, right, it's Target. Right. <laughs> so what we believe here is that we, uh, we give customers options that span from work days to work weekends. Remember going back to the other research, we know she's time pressed and she works and all this other stuff. The ink <laughs> customer is probably more fashion conscious than our, our, uh, our general demographic. Uh, most of them basically um, are urban or likes the urban lifestyle. She shops frequently um, and expects to find newness every time. And that, so when we took these things apart, we did the same exercise I was doing with you and saying, well, what does this mean? If she's fashion conscious, what does that mean? If she shops frequently, how many times do we need to you know, um, deliver newness um, you know, um, you know, to the store? So th it, it's a great exercise once you start breaking down these, these simple questions. 
just examples of basically how we incorporate. So the cover of the direct mail book then gets directly um, you know, taken into the store. All you guys who are here are manufacturers, vertical retailers. I know practice this all the time. 